Right, I've sent out an email saying we're having a technical difficulty and we'll get back to the lecture as soon as we're able to. Right, I've sent ah. out an email saying we're having a technical difficulty and we'll get back we're, to looks like we're, as we're able to. Looks like we're on now. Okay. Uh, I'll keep thank you, every, thank you, everybody. Um, excellent. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulties, but looks like they're all resolved and we can start now. So uh, I just want to start by thanking uh, the Rotary District 1285 for inviting me to deliver uh, this year's excitement of science lecture for schools. I'm very, very happy to be here. And I uh, also want to thank the University of Manchester for uh, hosting this live stream. And usually uh, we would host this in person on the university campus, but due to circumstances, we're doing this um, virtually. But nonetheless, I hope that everybody has a good experience and learns something new and interesting today. So my lecture today will be about graphene and two-dimensional materials, which is a new class of materials that people are um, we're researching on, studying and developing really exciting new applications with. At the end of this lecture, I will be taking your questions. Uh, so I have my Twitter open here and I've posted my Twitter handle as well. So if you have any questions, please tweet them uh, to me, or I also have the uh, live stream YouTube open here on the chat. Uh, I've already posted there about the IT delays, so you can um, post messages on uh, there as well. And I'll try and get to as many questions as I possibly can. Um, in, in the time that we have. So given that we've been slightly delayed, uh, I will talk uh, briefly uh, for about 40 minutes, 35 to 40 minutes. And then we have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. So let me start off by telling you what is graphene and uh, why it is such an important and exciting material. So graphene is the world's first two-dimensional material. That is uh, the main take-home message uh, from today's talk. So what is graphene? Graphene is a single atomic layer of carbon. So it is one atom layer of carbon where, where the carbon atoms in this layer are arranged in this sort of chicken wire structure, what we call a hexagonal lattice. So the graphene is a two-dimensional material because all the atoms in the graphene are just arranged in, in a sheet, in a single plane. So the graphene sheet has can be extended in the length direction. It can be extended in the thickness direction, but it cannot be made any thicker. So it's constrained in the third dimension which means that it's a two-dimensional material. The other way of looking at this is that, as you know, every material has electrons in it, and these electrons are responsible for conducting electricity and so on in any material. Now, in graphene, the electrons in this sheet of graphene are only able to move in two dimensions. They can only move left and right or front and back and they cannot move up and down. So from the perspective of the electron, it looks like the electron is living in a two-dimensional universe. So the electron only feels two dimensions. So from the electron's perspective, it's a two-dimensional material. Now, graphene is also the parent material for a number of other what we call low-dimensional allotropes of carbon. So you know what an allotrope is? It's a different form of a material. So if you take carbon, you will be familiar with diamond and graphite, 
um, and so on. So carbon has three dimensional allotropes, which is diamond, graphite, carbon, black, soot. It also has two dimensional allotropes, which is graphene. And if you, if you roll up the graphene sheet, you get what's known as a carbon nanotube. And that is a one dimensional allotrope of carbon. And if you cut the graphene sheet in this very specific shape, and you can roll it up into what essentially then ends up looking like a football, that is a zero dimensional allotrope of carbon. And that's known as a buckyball or a fullerene. Okay, so graphene is the parent 2D material. Graphene uh, has a very interesting and long history. Although it's a new material, theoretically, it's not a new material. And what I mean by that is graphene has been studied theoretically and also sort of accidentally made since a long time ago. So uh, graphene is, is essentially one layer of graphite, which everybody is familiar with. When you write with your pencil, that's what you're using. You're using graphite in the pencil lead. So because the pencil lead is not lead, it's made of graphite. So when you write with a pencil, you are making small pieces of graphene when you write, but you don't pick it up and study it. it, it it's usually not one atom layer thick when you write with a pencil. So the theoretical analysis of graphene has been going on for, for decades to try to understand the properties of graphene, but making graphene was always, a single layer of graphene was always considered very, very difficult because there is a theory that says that perfectly two-dimensional materials will not be stable, but we will come to that later on. However, there have been lots of efforts to make graphene. For example, people made graphene, which was grown on, on top of other materials and so on. Uh, the name graphene was first uh, coined in 1987. So we're getting to fairly uh, recent times, but the first sort of true two-dimensional graphene material was produced and studied in 2004 by Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov from the University of Manchester. And this was really the start of the graphene revolution or the graphene rush. And for their discovery of graphene and studying its properties, Andre and Kostya were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010. So for the rest of this talk, we will follow that journey of the discovery of graphene, the studying of the properties of graphene, and what um, sort of exciting applications um, it can be used for. So I told you before that graphene is a hexagonal lattice of carbon atoms, but how do we know that? Well, we know that because we can actually see it. Um, using something known as a transmission electron microscope. So just like a normal microscope that you might be using in your school lab uses light. So you look through the microscope and you're using light to illuminate the object that the light reflects back and you can see it. Similarly, in electron microscopy, you use electrons. And because uh, you're using electrons instead of light, you can get a much higher resolution image compared to just a, a normal optical or a light microscope. In fact, you can zoom things by up to a million times. And when you do that, you can then actually start to see the individual atoms. And you can see here, every white dot in this uh, lattice here is a carbon atom. So this is a single sheet of graphene that we can see in a transmission electron microscope. Um, and you can actually see every single carbon atom. You can even see here where there is a carbon atom that's actually missing a defect. All materials in the world will have defects in them. And this is an example of a place where a carbon atom is missing from this particular sheet of graphene. So then we can move on to uh, just briefly summarizing what makes graphene such an exciting material. Obviously, the first thing is that it's a two-dimensional material. It's the world's thinnest material because it's only one atom thick. Uh, and this, was, this makes it uh, a very, very interesting, a new type, a new class of, of materials. 
But on top of that, graphene actually turns out to be the strongest material that we've ever made, actually. It has the highest tensile strength of any material in the world. At the same time, it's also a very lightweight film because it's only one atom thick. And it's also a very transparent material because even though it actually absorbs quite a lot of light, it's, it's actually, you know, the parent material is graphite, which is black. So it actually absorbs a lot of light, but because it's so thin, most of the light goes through it. So it's actually 97, more than 97% transparent. And it's also the best conductor of electricity in the world. It's much more electrically conductive than gold or copper. It's also the best conductor of heat that we have in any material in the world. It's also flexible. It can be stretched and bent and twisted. Um, and it's, it's all, the, the, there, are, there might be other materials which, which have similar properties in one or two areas, but Graphene is amazing because it combines this strength, the flexibility, the transparency, electrical and, and, and thermal conductivity, its permeability and so on. It, it combines all of these amazing properties into one material. And that, that is what makes graphene really, really a very exciting material for us to study and to then use in various applications. But as a scientist, it's worth noting that this list is not complete. And that's why at the bottom of the list, I've actually put three dots. What that means is that the fundamental research, the fundamental science behind all of this is still very much underway. We're still spending a lot of time studying the fundamental properties of graphene and beyond graphene. So towards the end of this lecture, I will talk about uh, derivatives of graphene and uh, uh, other materials, other two-dimensional materials uh, that are like graphene but have different properties. So we're, we're studying the fundamental properties of these two-dimensional materials even today. So it's not just about developing applications anymore. It's still very much an active basic research field. So moving on from what makes graphene so exciting? Let's look at how to make graphene. So the first graphene material, which I told you about, which was made by Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov uh, in 2003, 2004, was actually made using a very deceptively simple method known as micromechanical cleavage or micromechanical exfoliation. Uh, or in colloquial terms, the cellar tape or scotch tape method. So what they actually did was they took a piece of cellar tape or sticky tape and peeled very, very carefully a very thin sheet of graphite from a bigger sheet of graphite. And then they repeated this many times. And each time you do that, each time you peel a, a, a few layers of the sheet of graphite, you make it thinner and thinner. So by repeating this process very carefully, they managed to produce some very, very, very thin sheets of graphene, of graphite actually. And then when they put that on a substrate and they looked at that material that they had produced under a light, under an optical microscope, they saw something that looks like this, what you see here on the left-hand side with all kinds of different colors, yellow and blue and purple. The purple background or pink purple background that you see, that is the surface, the substrate, the silicon wafer um, that, is, that they put everything on. And then this, the, the yellow pieces that you see, those are very uh, thick pieces of graphite. So it's still not thin enough to be graphene. And then you can see the blue areas, there it's starting to get really thin. It might be few layers of graphene thick. And then the really light purple areas that you see, that's really, really thin, that's graphene. And then you zoom into those areas and you try and find something which looks like the image on the right-hand side, where you can see here a very light purple patch that is a one layer of carbon atom, that is graphene, one layer graphene. 
And the slightly darker purple, that's two layers of graphene. And it gets a bit darker, that's three layers. So three, literally three layers of atoms. So we can actually see with just our eyes, even in an optical microscope, you don't need an electron microscope, even in a normal optical microscope, you can actually see the single atomic layer, the thinnest material in the world using uh, this kind of an approach. So that actually made it very easy then to study its properties and that this method of making graphene is what revolutionized the study of the properties of graphene. However, you will appreciate that this is not a way to make graphene on a large scale. You can't make graphene this way in tons or in large area for any real world applications because you're just taking a very, very small piece of graphene each time using, using sellotape. That's not what we call a scalable method. So what we need are scalable methods for making graphene. And I'll talk about a couple of them. One is known as chemical vapor deposition. So what we do in chemical vapor deposition, we actually take a gas like methane, which contains carbon, and we flow the methane over a very hot metal surface, typically copper. The methane breaks down into carbon and hydrogen. The carbon atoms will deposit on the hot metal surface and form a sheet of graphene. So that's known as chemical vapor deposition. And this method is actually then scalable. And by that, I mean, we can make large continuous sheets of graphene this way. For example, using a method known as scale, uh, sorry, roll to roll uh, growth. So you just take a roll of copper, a continuous large roll of copper, and you, you pass it through a furnace to heat it up. You flow the gases. And at the end of the day, you get very large sheets of graphene, which can even be a large continuous sheet of graphene, which can be used for many things, which I will talk about uh, uh, very soon. So that's how you make large sheets. But then how do you make like buckets of graphene? How do you make kilos or tons of graphene powder? You can do that using a method known as solution exfoliation. So what you do in solution exfoliation, you take graphite. So unlike chemical vapor deposition, where you make the graphene from gas, and that's known as what we call a bottom up way of making graphene, you can make graphene from graphite, but not with a sellotape. You just put the graphite into water or something like that, and you hit it with a lot of energy, usually ultrasonic energy or shear energy, and you blast the graphite into small pieces. And when you do that, you break apart the graphite and you release the graphene layers. And these graphene layers then disperse in, in the water or in some other solvent. Sometimes you have to use other chemicals to stabilize this dispersion. And you can get like a big bottle or even a large vat of graphene particles, which are dissolved or dispersed in water or other solvents. And then you can dry that out and extract the individual sheets of graphene in, in a large quantity. However, when you do that, because you're using so much of energy to break the graphite, you create a lot of defects. I showed you the uh, electron microscope image where you saw a missing atom. When you use a lot of energy to blast the graphite apart, you create lots of those kinds of defects, which means that this large amount of graphene you produce, unfortunately, is not the best quality. It has a defective material. On the other hand, when you grow the graphene from a gas phase, it's a very controlled process. So the sheet of graphene that you make is very high quality. The number of defects is very low. But obviously, that means it's also produced in smaller quantities and is more expensive. So depending on what application you want, you have to match that application with the graphene material that gives you the right price and the right quality. So for example, if you want to make computer chips, computer chips are expensive uh, and they use only a small amount of graphene, but they have to have the best quality graphene. So clearly you would use 
chemical vapor deposition because even though that gives you small quantity of graphene, it gives you the best quality. But if you want to mix the graphene in with something like a rubber or, or, or something else to make it stronger, or you want to coat a large area of something to protect it with graphene, I'll talk about these later. You need a large amount of material, but you don't need super high quality, but you need it to be really, really cheap. So then you use liquid phase exfoliation graphene. So it all depends at the end of the day, what you want to do with it, you will pick the right kind of graphene. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit of a story here before I move on to the graphene properties. Um, the, the, remember I told you before that Andre and Kostya, when they made the graphene, they actually put the graphene down on a surface and then looked in the optical microscope and they were able to see it. And the fact that they were able to see it is what really revolutionized the graphene research. It, it meet, meant everybody could use that method to make graphene. But there is actually a bit of luck involved there because this doesn't work on just any old substrate. You can't just put the graphene down on any material or any surface and immediately see it. You have to have a very special kind of surface, which fortunately is quite popular in, in semiconductor technology. And it just so happened that um, Andre and Kostya, when they were doing this experiment, they used a particular kind of surface on which they could see it. If they had used even a slightly different type of surface to put the graphene on, they wouldn't have seen it. They wouldn't have known that they had made it. So in any, even the best scientists in the world always have to rely sometimes on an element of luck. It's what we call serendipity in science. So even, so even the best scientists, even the best research sometimes has to rely on luck. So for example, you might've heard about the uh, smallpox vaccine, for example it saved millions and millions of lives, but that was also what we call a serendipitous or accidental discovery. So this actually plays a very big role in, in science. I will talk a little bit as well about how you measure these properties of graphene. I told you before that um, graphene has the biggest strength in, in, of, of any material in the world. But what does that mean? How, how would you know that, that graphene is, is such a strong material? It's, it's a very thin material. So how do you measure its strength? You can't, you can't hold the sheet of graphene in, in two ends and pull it and stretch it like, like you would do with, uh, with a normal material. So how would you measure a, a single atomic layer thick material for its strength? So you have to come up with innovative ways of doing that. And the way we do that is you take the sheet of graphene, and you put it on top of holes in a surface, and then you poke it with an atomically sharp needle, what is known as a nano indentation technique. So the whole measurement is done in very, very small uh, dimensions. So the needle, the tip of the needle is, is, is thinner than the width of, of, uh, of your hair. So we have to do some very, very challenging and clever experiments to study you know, you poke it till it bursts and then you measure how, how much force you applied and then you have to use complex mathematical models to extract the strength of the graphene. So it's actually quite a lot of very high tech equipment, expensive equipment and lots of research that goes into studying these, these two dimensional materials. So having talked about what makes graphene so exciting, what are its properties, how it's made, I'll spend the last 15 or 20 minutes telling you a bit about the applications of graphene and, and other what's going on nowadays in terms of other two-dimensional materials. So graphene has a lot of very, very exciting applications. And, and the, the beauty of this is I told you before, it's not about any one amazing property. It's about bringing together lots of the best properties of graphene. So one area where there is quite a lot of research going on with graphene materials for, for applications is in touch screens for phones and tablets and laptops. We've just in the last couple of years started to see phones which can bend and fold in half, like uh, there are a few of them out there. In order for you to do that, the, the, the display of the phone has to have conductive materials which are transparent and flexible and very highly conductive. And there are very, very few materials which can do that and graphene is one of them. So there is a lot of research going on now into developing high quality graphene 
for transparent, bendable, flexible displays. And I don't mean just bending it in half. It's displays which can be folded and rolled up and, and wrapped around surfaces. And I will show you an example of something like that in a video in, in a little bit about how you can do a device like that with graphene. Now, I also told you that graphene has a very high strength and very high electrical conductivity and very high heat conductivity. But you can then give other materials, like for example, if you take rubber or plastic, they're not very strong materials. They don't have heat conductivity. They don't have electrical conductivity. So how do you get a strong rubber or how do you get a strong plastic or how do you get a plastic which conducts electricity and conducts heat? Well, you can add graphene to it. So these are what we call composite materials. So composite means it's a combination of two materials. So you can take plastics, rubbers, add graphene and make them stronger, make them more conductive, make them better barrier materials. And then you can use these for things before, like for example, if you have conductive plastics, there are things you can do with that, which you cannot do with normal plastics. Um, the other thing you can do as well with, with graphene is that because it has this layer structure, it's like a sheet, you can actually cover materials with this and engineer this, this coating or this membrane in such a way that either it lets things go through it or it doesn't. And when it lets something go through it, you can control the size of what it lets through. So, and, and this, you can do this down to single atoms. So you can say, okay, I will control this membrane so that it allows water to go through, but it doesn't allow helium or, or, or alcohol to go through. And what would you use something like that for? Well, for making biofuels, so for separating ethanol and water for fuel production or for something like um, corrosion protection. So if you want to protect a surface from getting corroded, so if you take a piece of metal, if you leave it outside in the rain, it, it gets corroded, it may get turns brown, but you can coat it with graphene and it will protect the surface because the water and the oxygen cannot go through the graphene and, and attack the metal. So you can use it as a protective corrosion protection coating. There are also, so these, these are more what I would call near term applications, but there are also applications which are more far term. So that might happen in 10 or 20 years or 30 years down the line. And medical applications is one such example. So what people have shown in some really exciting research is you can take little particles of graphene and you can put these into the cell, into the body, and you can attach uh, drugs and you can attach various molecules into this and send them into the body to target and cure various diseases. And you can make the graphene only go into certain types of cells. So for example, you can make the graphene go into um, only cancer cells, but not affect non-cancer cells. So you can make what we call targeted drug delivery to, uh, to treat patients without harming the healthy body tissue. But this kind of application is actually really, really exciting, but much, much longer term because we have to do still a lot of research to make sure it's a safe way of doing things. So, but, but the potential is there and it's very exciting. Uh, another application which is probably more close to market is sensors. So you can use graphene to detect gases and chemicals and, and, and for example, doing blood tests and things like that. What is, you know, check for sugar or check for diseases or things, you know, in, in your blood or in, um, are there any toxic gases in, in an industrial environment? Are there any toxic chemicals in the water? You can do tests for all kinds of different things. So to do that, what you would do is you actually build what we call an electronic device with graphene. You, you, collect, you, co you connect two electrodes to the graphene and you pass a current through it because the graphene is a conductor. But if gas molecules or chemicals stick to the graphene, then it changes the amount of current that flows through the graphene. And the amount of this change is related to the amount of material that sticks on the graphene. So using that method, you can actually detect various gases and chemicals that are in the environment in, that is surrounding the graphene. 
using these kind of graphene devices. There are also other types of sensors that, that, that you could make. You can make sensors that can detect pressure. You can make sensors that can detect temperature changes. So there are lots of various kinds of sensors that one could make with graphene. You can even detect light. For example, the, the camera in, in, in your phone has a detector which can detect light. How much light is falling on the sensor? That's how you take a picture. You can actually build a camera sensor like that, a very highly sensitive camera sensor with graphene, which means that a future camera phone might be able to take really amazing pictures, much better than what, what you can take today. You can also not just detect how much light is falling on the graphene, you can actually absorb that light and convert it into electricity. So you can use graphene and other two dimensional materials that I'll come to later to actually generate uh, electricity from light. You can also use graphene to make batteries and supercapacitors, which, which can store this energy much more efficiently and charge and discharge much faster than the conventional uh, batteries that we have today. So for things like, like electric vehicles, electric cars, you need lots of energy. You need it to charge fast. You need it to release this energy fast so your car can go uh, long distances and can go at a good speed. So for energy storage applications as well, graphene has a lot of potential. I told you before, I'll show you some examples of applications. So this is one which I have developed in my group, which combines a number of things I told you about before. It's a, it's a transparent, flexible touch sensor, which is also a pressure sensor. So it tells you how hard you're pressing down and so on. So I'm gonna play this video and hopefully you can hear the sound, but there is also closed captioning in case the sound doesn't work. So hopefully let's see how this goes. Our flexible force sensor is being pressed whilst force data is shown in real time. The sensor's high refresh rate can pick up microsecond scale interactions and can distinguish over 100 pressure levels reliably. The sensor can be flexed repeatedly without damage or drift in the data. And it is also transparent, allowing us to stack optical sensors below. For example, a light sensor can detect and track an object before its impact on a surface. Or a color sensor can distinguish between objects with the same shape whilst determining how firm the contact is on a surface. We can also connect multiple sensors in an array to enable force mapping. This allows us to understand the subtleties of complex interactions. So as you saw in that uh, uh, video, we can make some very, very interesting uh, devices using graphene um, for force and touch sensing. So this is a, a, a we have a big European Europe-wide project known as the graphene flagship. And the graphene flagship has released a, a roadmap when you might expect different potential applications of graphene. So you can see here batteries, coatings, composites, electronics, printable electronics, photo detectors, uh, automotive components, and so on. So there are uh, there's a huge number of different potential applications of graphene, which in the next twenty, in the next two to twenty to thirty years, you could start to see. Uh, really ubiquitously available. So I think you have a very good idea now of what makes graphene so exciting, the, number, the real amazing potential for a wide range of different applications of graphene. So it's, it's for all of these reasons, uh, for, for discovering this amazing material and studying its properties, Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010. And the citation for the Nobel Prize was for groundbreaking experiments regarding the two-dimensional material graphene. Now, let's go beyond graphene. What else is there in the, in the world of two-dimensional materials? So first, you can take graphene and you can modify it. You can attach, for example, to every carbon atom in the sheet, a hydrogen atom. And then you get something known as graphene which is a very interesting in its own right. You attach every carbon atom, a fluorine atom. And when you do that, you get something known as fluorographing. 
Actually, fluorographene is the single atomic layer version of Teflon, which everybody's familiar with it. You know, your, your cooking ware is coated with Teflon most likely. So it's an atomically thin layer of Teflon, which is a non-stick high barrier material. So there are again, lots of applications for such thin materials. You can also make something known as graphene oxide, which is actually a version of graphene, which is dissolvable in, in water. So again, for coatings and composites, it's a very, very exciting material. You can also do something known as twisted graphene. So I told you before that graphene can have one layer of carbon, but then you can also make two layer graphene and three layer graphene, four layer graphene. Now, normally in graphite in nature, the, the individual graphene layers in graphite are on top of each other in, in the same orientation. However, if you put one layer of graphene on top of another layer of graphene and you change how they are rotated with respect to each other, like you can see here, you rotate the graphene, one graphene layer with respect to the other, you change the properties of graphene and you can make some very exciting materials. Even superconductivity has been observed in what we call twisted uh, bilayer graphene. So this kind of twisted graphene materials is now a very, very hot and exciting topic for people who are doing fundamental science. And hopefully in some years, we'll actually start making real applications out of that. But uh, what the bigger field of study is actually other two dimensional materials. It, so graphene is one layer of carbon. You can also make one layer of other atoms. You can make one layer of uh, mixtures of atoms like one, one atomic layer of boron nitride which is, a, which is an insulator, like graphene is a conductor, boron nitride is an insulator. You can make one atomic layer of molybdenum disulfide or tungsten disulfide, which unlike graphene are semiconductors. So you can make all kinds of different materials, which are all one atom thick or one or few atoms thick with amazing properties of their own. And these are all again, new materials which are being studied extensively. And then you can do something really, really interesting. And this is where you actually start to beat nature. What you can do, you can take these individual layers and you can shuffle them like a deck of cards. You can combine them in any order you want. So you can make interesting materials that have a, a conductive graphene and a insulator of boron nitride and a semiconductor of, of tungsten disulfide. So you, and this is the sort of architecture structure that you find in your computer chips, but your computer chips are actually compared to this much bigger, even though they're actually really, really small. You might, you know, your computer, if you look into this more carefully, you might say, okay, this, this microchip uses a 10 nanometer process, but a single layer of graphene is less than one nanometer. So you can actually make your computer chip even 10 times smaller and more powerful than it is today by using atomically thin electronic materials. Okay, I'm getting to the end of my talk, five more minutes. Um, why do I have a, have a picture of Glamour magazine in my, in my talk? Well, uh, a few years ago, there was a feature in Glamour magazine where they said, okay, what, what could be the potential future careers for, for young people like you? And one of the five that they listed was graphene engineer. And why, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is because uh, graphene is going to be a very big field. Graphene is going to have a lot of opportunity in the future and a lot of very exciting things are going to be made with graphene. So, you know, you should seriously consider when you go to uni, uh, do you want to specialize in something like graphene or nanomaterials, more broadly speaking, advanced materials? So materials, nanomaterials, graphene is a very, very exciting field with a lot of opportunities uh, in the future where we can engineer the world around us using these advanced materials that we are developing. Now, how do you take graphene? We've done all this amazing research in, in the lab. How do you take this research and commercialize it? To do this, we have to have different institutions, different institutes doing what we call scale up. So in the lab, we do basic research. And then in, at the University of Manchester, we have something known as the National Graphene Institute. So in the National Graphene Institute, you do the basic research, fundamental studies, all the uh, two-dimensional materials I was telling you about, 
All of this work is done in the National Graphene Institute. And when we have an exciting idea that we want to scale up, we want to work with companies, we want to produce new products, we want to do new companies, then the technology moves down the road to another building, which is known as the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center. And here we have equipment for turning the basic research into large products and into large amounts of material. So we can then work with companies to take our research from the lab to the marketplace. And that's what we're trying to do at the university at the moment. And I'll finish off here by just giving you another short video of a, a story about how my research group and me worked with the company to develop a graphene product, which you can now actually go and buy from the shop. Okay, so I, let's have a uh, watch here. Innovate was founded 15 years ago. The brand has grown at the heart of the business. It's always innovating in product. We have been working on graphene composites, particularly graphene elastomer composites like rubber and polyurethane for a few years now. And we were aware of the significant improvement that graphene can bring to these materials. We started collaborating with the University of Manchester when I was intrigued about the potential for graphene being included in our products. We initially used the EPSRC IAA fund to prove the concept. I developed the first graphene rubber compound which gave significant improvement in grip and durability. Normally you have a compromise in rubber if you need it to provide good grip, it needs to be a soft rubber, which also tends to wear away very quickly. So by adding the graphene to this rubber, we've been able to get a new compound, which has both the elasticity required to give superior grip and also the durability uh, required to make it last long. As soon as we found out that it had the potential to bond with rubber and could be used in the soles of our product to strengthen that rubber and, and increase the performance properties of the rubber. It really just spiraled from there. We're now continuing the collaboration through a KTP project, which continues the development of this compound, optimizing it, improving it, and also to incorporate the graphene into other parts of the shoe beyond the outsole. I'm continuing to support the collaboration with Innovate by sharing my expertise with the new KTP associate and training him on the lab equipment and processes. The main aim of my role is to essentially transfer the knowledge gained from the National Graphene Institute to Innovate so that they can use the knowledge and the skills across their business. I think the combination of both research and industry exposure has been very positive. Athletes no longer need to compromise. We've delivered the world's toughest grip, which is 50% stronger, 50% more elastic, 50% harder wearing. It's very rare that a new material comes to market that can give such significant performance enhancement benefits to a product. We launched this product on July the 12th and we had press from around the world at that launch event. The product has been received incredibly well. Any knowledge generated in the university is best served if it actually results in some impact for society and this can only realistically be achieved if we have a strong partnership between business which is going to take the technology from the university and translate it into the real world. It's about getting the science and academic knowledge that we have in universities across the UK and sharing that and imparting it on business so that British business can go out there and lead the world in innovation. So uh, I will wrap up by just saying that we regularly run outreach events at various science festivals like ScienceX and so on, uh, uh, Jodrell Bank Live. So if you want to meet uh, the graphene scientists, you should come to these events, keep your eyes open. You will get a chance in these events to actually make your own graphene using sellotape and graphite. 
So it's a really nice experience. You're welcome. Please keep your eyes open for that. Um, I want to thank my research group. So these are the people that do all the hard work that I'm here presenting to you about. So I want to thank all of them. I also once again want to thank uh, the Rotary uh, and the University of Manchester. Uh, that's the end of my lecture. So if you have any questions, please tweet me or post your questions on the YouTube channel chat um, and I will pick them up and answer them. So thank you very much. And I look forward to getting some questions from you. While we wait for any questions, I just want to add as well, there is, there is a bit of a delay. Uh, I think uh, a rather long delay between what I'm actually saying here and, and by the time it actually streams on YouTube. So there might be a telegraph delay in doing the Q&A as well. Um, so if you have any questions, if, if, I, if I don't get to your questions uh, live now, if you tweet me, I'm happy to answer them um, separately as well. So let's just give it a minute or two to see if there are any questions that come in. So I have uh, one question which has come in, which says, um, how expensive is it to make a sheet of graphene? That's a very good question. I told you before that the cost of graphene depends on the kind of graphene that you have, right? So for example, if you're using chemical vapor deposition, you can make a very large sheet of graphene, maybe a, a meter long, and it will cost you a few pounds. Uh, on the other hand, if you, it, but it doesn't weigh very much, right? If, if, you, if you use uh, uh, liquid phase exfoliation, you can actually make uh, a ton of graphene as a powder form. And, and uh, maybe a kilogram of graphene will, will cost uh, a few pounds. So it all depends at the end of the day uh, on the kind of graphene you want, the quality of the graphene you want. So it's very difficult to put a single price on, on graphene. Uh, but yeah, it, that, that is a very important consideration. Um, we have another question that's come in. So when you write with a pencil, is the thing that shows on our paper one sheet of graphene or multiple sheets of graphene? So when you write with a pencil, the graphite that's in the pencil lead actually the normal pencils that you might use in school uh, is a, is got graphite powder, but it's mixed in with binders and stuff. So it's not just graphite, but if you, if you use an artist pencil, which is made of pure graphite, then what is left behind is actually still very thick sheets of graphite. It's not, it doesn't really get down to a single sheet of, there might be, you know, a few very, very thin pieces of graphene here and there, but mostly they're quite thick sheets. That's why it looks quite, quite dark but you can actually maybe look through that very, very carefully in a microscope and you might find some small particles of single layers of graphene. Um, another question that's come in, um, is there a chance for another type of graphene made of another atom, which have even better properties? Well, I don't know about better properties, but different properties, yes. So for example, you can make a, graphene-like material with, uh, with silicon, which would be a semiconductor, 
graphene is not a semiconductor. It's not a better thing or worse thing to be a semiconductor. It's different and you can use it for different things. Um, and then we have another question, which is um, what application of graphene are you most excited about? I think that's, <laughs> well, my research group, I'll tell you a little bit about what we focus on. So my research group has two areas of, of interest. One is composite materials. So as you saw from uh, the video I showed you, we make composites of graphene with rubbers and other materials to make them stronger and have uh, multifunctional properties. So that's very exciting to me. And we also do a lot of work on sensors. Again, you saw the video from my group on the touch sensors, the flexible transparent sensors. And we also do a lot of work on biosensors, which I mentioned before as well. So my two main exciting areas are composite materials and sensors. Uh, let's look at some YouTube questions. Um, what is the potential for applications of graphene in the aerospace industry? So in aerospace industry, uh, sensors, I think uh, is extremely exciting because if you think of a plane, it's, it's decked with sensors. It has sensors, literally every inch of it is covered in sensors because you need to know what's going on. You need to have sensors that can detect the stresses, the, the speed, the temperature, the, you know, everything that's going on in a plane has to be detected. Um, uh, so a lot of sensors and you want the sensors in a plane to be small and lightweight and low power. So that's why graphene is really exciting because you can make lightweight, low power sensors. You can also make materials, composite materials, which uh, can provide the same performance, uh, but can be lighter. So there are lots of things, even the seat that you sit on in a plane is, is quite heavy, but you might be able to make it out of graphene composite, which is lightweight, which means it reduces fuel consumption. So there's lots of potential areas in, in composite materials and sensors uh, in, in aerospace uh, applications. Um, can graphene be combined with any other substance than rubber? Yes, graphene can be combined with all kinds of materials, rubbers, lots of different rubbers, plastics, all kinds, pretty much any kind of plastic um, you can combine with graphene. You can even mix graphene with other metals. You can coat graphene on top of different things. So yeah, and, and even liquids, you can mix graphene into other kinds of liquids like oil. So yeah, all kinds of different materials can be combined and improved using graphene. Um, let me look back into Twitter. Would you personally recommend an academic career and is it worth the years of school to you personally? Uh, slightly different question, but I'm very, very happy to answer that. Uh, personally speaking, I would say yes, it's absolutely worth it. Um, it all depends on what drives you, what excites you. It is a lot of effort, uh, a lot of years of schooling, as has been noted. You have to study, you have to do your undergraduate degree, you have to do your master's degree, you typically have to do a PhD. Then you have to do many years of, of uh, postdoctoral research before you actually become um, um, an academic. So it's a lot of years of, of hard work, but that's also true. For example, if you want to be a doctor, you still have to study many years and then you have to do a, uh, you know, be a junior doctor and so on before you become a full-fledged doctor. So it, it is a lot of effort, but I think it's totally worth it because you get to discover new things, uh, which is really exciting. It really stimulates you, excites you. You get to teach people. Uh, you know, you, you get to lecture the next generation. So it's a very, very satisfying and fulfilling career. I would absolutely recommend it to anybody that, that wants it. Um, we're, we're, we're up to the full hour now. So I will uh, bring this to a close. We're also running out of questions. Um, I want to thank everybody again who participated. I hope that we reached out to a lot of schools. Apologies for the technical issues at the start. Again, thanks to Manchester University and Rotary 1285. And I hope that you all learned something today. I hope that you are all um, stimulated to pursue research, academia, science, even in general, engineering, maths, STEM subjects. And if you have any further questions, then please post it to me on Twitter and I'll be happy to get back to you. So thank you very much and uh, everybody have a good afternoon.